Buddha never said that we were innately good. He never said we were innately bad. The mind, when you look at it, has all kinds of ideas, all kinds of potentials, good and bad. The mind itself is neither. And John Cha has a nice statement where he says, the mind isn't is anything. You can't really define the mind as this, that, or the other thing. It's just the, the quality of knowing. And John Lee makes a comment that the mind is neither good nor bad, but it knows good and bad. And it develops good and bad habits, but eventually it learns how to let go of both good and bad. What this means is, on the one side, pointing out that the mind is not innately bad means that we really can help ourselves. If the mind were innately bad, everything that came out of the mind would be tainted, unreliable. You'd have to depend on some outside force or outside power to save, your, save you from yourself. When the Buddha says we're not <coughs> we're innately good, that means there's no spot in the mind that you can tap into where you know, okay, from everything that comes from this spot is wise and pure and reliable. So what do you do? You try to develop skillful qualities as best you can. In fact, the process of developing skillful qualities is in and of, of itself a skill. And as with any skill, they're gradations. given the amount of virtue you can develop, the amount of concentration, your discernment will get more and more subtle, more and more precise as you develop this skill. This is why the path is said to be gradual. The Buddha's image is of the continental shelf off of India. There's a gradual slope and then a sudden drop-off. We all like the idea of the sudden drop-off. We'd like to go right there right away. But you can't get there without the gradual slope. In other words, the potential for awakening is, in principle, always present. But it requires really subtle discernment, and discernment is something that has to be gradually developed. And it plays a role in the entire path. It's not the case that you develop virtue and then move on to concentration and finally get the chance to develop discernment. You need discernment as you're developing your virtue, and you need to develop discernment in order to get into concentration if you don't understand what's going on in the mind, if you don't have strategies for detecting the hindrances and dealing with them. The mind's never going to settle down. which means that you apply discernment all the way along, simply that it gets more precise, clearer, sharper, more all around as the path develops. So how you develop it? You develop by testing things. And you focus on your actions. You learn from your actions. And John Lee's example is of learning how to sew a pair of pants. The teacher will teach you, okay, this is how you cut the cloth and this is how you push the needle through the cloth. This is how you thread the needle. But how they're going to look when you come out, when you're done, that depends on your own ability to observe what you're doing. You look at it, and the, the stitches are uneven, and the cloth is poorly cut, doesn't fit. Okay, what do you do? Do you give up? No, you just go back and you try it again. Then you try to observe each time what went wrong the last time around, so you can correct for it the next time. And don't expect that your second pair will be perfect. It takes a while to figure out what to look for and how to judge what works and what doesn't work. And you find that as you get better and better, 
of being a tailor. Your standards of what qualifies as acceptable workmanship are going to rise. It comes from being willing to make a few mistakes and then learn from the mistakes. The kind of person who never wants to admit a mistake is never going to make any progress in this path. And the person who wants to have absolutely guaranteed skill right from the very beginning is never going to make progress in the path. You have to be willing to make a mistake and then learn from it. That attitude is probably the most important part of the practice. Because when the Buddha set out his teaching, he didn't make it depend on our innate goodness or whatever. It depended on our desire for true happiness. And the interesting thing is that he never defines what true happiness is. Why is that? One reason might be that as you practice your idea of what qualifies as happiness, what qualifies as well-being, is going to develop as well. Simply you want to maintain that desire for happiness is not going to let you down. And John Munn's final sermon focused in on this. He says he talks about the different aspects of the practice as being different parts of an army. And as for the warrior and his weapon, that's the desire never to come back and have to suffer ever again. It's that desire not to suffer, which we all have, that forms the foundation of how we can practice. The Buddha simply takes it to a level of skill, a level all around discernment that goes way beyond what the rest of the world would have accepted. The Buddha had very high standards, and he wants you to have high standards too what you will take as satisfactory happiness, what you will take as satisfactory well-being. He shows you step by step by step that this is better than where you were, and this is better than that, and this is better than that, step by step. And it's up to you to decide whether you're satisfied with the steps. He himself said that the secret of his awakening was he never let himself rest content with the level of his skill. So it's up to you to decide how far you want to go on the path. Nobody's pushing you. Nobody's forcing it. The Buddha himself doesn't try to force it. After all, he never said that he was our creator. He can't lay down laws for us. He speaks with the authority of an expert, someone who's found that there really is an end to suffering. And when you end the mind's self-inflicted sufferings, you solve all the mind's other problems as well. And so he points out the way. And it's up for us to ask ourselves, how seriously do you want to be truly happy? And that's a question that each of us has to answer for him or herself alone.